Welcome everyone to the C-Suite Marketing Perspectives Podcast. I'm Steve McDonald, the host. And today, Ron Carson is our guest. And Ron, you've been in the market uh, marketing for 25 years as a CMO. You've been with startups. You've been in Silicon Valley. You've been with multi-billion dollar behemoths, right? You've kind of done it all. And through your career, you've developed a real point of view on what CMOs should be doing. And one of the kind of the most important aspects of our jobs that we should be focusing on that creates not only success for us in our roles as CMOs, because unfortunately, CMOs, we we fail quicker than anybody else in the C-suite. <laughs> That's a proven fact. We you know, last half as long as CEOs. So part of what we're going to talk about today is the critical role that a CMO role plays and how you add value into that organization. And there's a there's a saying that you had said many, many times during our calls leading up to this on the just ask. And so I want to get into that, but maybe please explain a little bit more about your background, um, what you're doing at Teradota right now, and then we'll get started. Yeah, th thank you for that. So yeah, I've got um, you know, 25 plus years. I did the math on LinkedIn of when I started to now, and I was a little shocked about how long the career has been. Uh, thought I'd be on the cover of some business magazines by now, but no, no such luck. Uh, anyways, mixed background, um, coming from uh, Silicon Valley initially, uh, working with some of the, the larger well-known companies out there to some consulting and now a CMO at Teradata. Um, I, I guess the, uh, the interesting thing about the experience is the ability to move from within a company to being a consultant on the outside from being a marketing leader to being a quota carrying sales rep and back and forth a couple of times has really kind of rounded out the experience. And I'd say that being a, a quota carrying sales rep kind of sharpens your marketing skills uh, as well along the way and really helped um, gel this idea. I'm, you know, I tell my, my colleagues and customers and, you know, colleagues at, at work, this just ask concept. If you just take the time to just ask, just talk to the people you want to sell to and ask them, how do we sell and market to you? They will tell you. It might not be what you want or expect to hear, but they will tell you. See, that's fascinating, right? I love that. Just ask. And they will tell you how we should be marketing. And that's what we, that's what we spend our careers, our lives trying to figure out, right? Yeah. So Exactly. That, tell me, get me into that a little bit more, right? Because, you know, obviously that's what all of our goal is, right? So, and, and we all know it's important, right? We, we've got to talk to customers. We've got to represent customers. In fact, you talk about, uh, you know, representing the customer as, you know, the marketing voice inside of the company. But tell us what your philosophy is behind the Just Ask and how you actually draw that kind of information out. Yeah, so um, I, I think in a, the normal day-to-day -day operations of a marketing department or, or a company, ironically, marketing loses touch with customers um, for, for various reasons. Like in large companies that I used to work in, marketing wasn't allowed to almost, right? <laughs> the a sales team owned those relationships. Therefore, marketing should not be touching them. In smaller companies, at least not without permission, in smaller companies, um, Everybody's so busy trying to get product out the door, that minimum viable product. And, and you know, they, they do some of the, the market or validation at that stage. But in terms of how do we take this better mousetrap and actually talk to the market in ways that it will resonate, right? How do we make them want to, to get our product? That gets lost. And so it has to be this um, purposeful part of what a marketing department does to just go and talk to Customers are one thing, but also non-customers. Uh, could be former customers, could be prospects. And by removing all hint or, yeah, I'll say hint or sense of a sales pitch, a, a hidden sales pitch in there, you can really get them to open up. I love that. So right there, you've given us one of the biggest keys, right? Because there are certain things that there's tremendous learnings, right, from sales. And you know, using technologies like Gong and listening into then the recordings of sales calls. But A, that's a seller selling. Yeah. And they're supposed to be the trusted advisor, right? They're supposed to be advising and educating and, and helping their clients. And so they're supposed to be in the know. 
right? They're not supposed to be asking those questions that you're talking about, right? <laughs> so there's a whole different level when you take away the, this is a sales call, right? Yeah. This has a different higher purpose. And so tell me that, that right there is one of the yeah. biggest clues, I think. Um, but tell me, how do you get on the call? Like what's in it for the, you know, for the customer or the prospect, you know, how do you get them involved in this kind of a conversation that they're, they're wanting to, to share this kind of information with you? Yeah. Well, and it can vary by industry, right? So if you're trying to get investment bankers, type A personality, Wall Street, Silicon Valley on the phone to talk shop, that can be a little harder, granted. Um, other markets are a little easier. Uh, generally speaking, people want to be expert. Um, they want to be heard. They want to be listened to. Um, and in a, a, the sales call, trying to extract the insight and intel out of there, it's different, right? They, the buyer, th their guard is up, right? They're not, they're not wanting to disclose too much information that the sales reps can then use against them, uh, quote unquote. Um, it's just a very different conversation. It's letting that person on the other end of the phone be the expert, let them talk. And, but also having the, the business, this isn't something you delegate down to the summer interns or the, the, the newbies fresh out of business school. You need a little bit of business acumen to know what are the things we're fishing for, right? We're, we're looking for a messaging, positioning, value propositions, buying motivations, buying objections, and being able to pull on those threads as they come up in a conversation um, so that you can get to the answers you need as a marketing department. It keeps you in sync with what they're thinking, their, their priorities, the, the preferred channels, mode of communication, also the right value propositions you're going you're gonna to take to the market. It's not always what you think it is. So here's the, the two dots that I'm just connecting right now. And that is because you started this out by saying, you know, just to ask. And if, if you ask, they'll actually tell you how to market. So like, okay, here's up, right? You also just said that they want to be the expert, right? They want to share this information with you. So if you're going to ask, then they're going to, there's, there's a part of us that wants to say, yeah, we know what we're doing, right? You know, we should be listened to. We, we've reached this pinnacle in our career. So what you can also ask, I imagine is, I don't quite understand that problem you're having. Yeah. I, I don't quite understand the risk that this poses for you and your company. Can you explain that a little bit more? Right. I can't have that on a sales conversation, right? No. And so that is how I think you're saying they tell you how to market to them, right? It's in the questions that you ask and the responses that they give. Would that be a good I, take? Away? Yeah, absolutely. You can absolutely approach the questions that way. And that's a good way. I, I self-deprecatingly call it play the stupid card. No, I don't get it. Yes. Tell me. And they love that, right? They, that that helps get their guard down because they they know you're less of a threat. Um, but you can also ask very specific, pointed questions and go, "All right, so in a very crowded environment, we have this solution. You kind of understand what it does. How do we get your attention?" Right. Pathetically, I mean, so you can How do we get you your can attention? approach this in different directions. Once their uh, trust level is up, right? They're they're less worried that you're about to spring a surprise sales pitch on them. Uh, then you can be more direct and, and really ask them to give you the answer. I had a uh, CMO of a, a company. It was the title was all about the, the podcast, all about how to create a hockey stick. And he would literally ask customers, where do you do your research? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're, we're trying to find in this omni-channel world, right? Where we're going to like dice up our, our resources and our marketing spend and everything. He literally would ask them, you know, where do you go to do your research? And that's, we know they're doing more and more and more research these days. You know, 83% of buyers are done with their research before they want to talk to anybody inside of the company, right? So that's, I think that's just an example, right? Of the yeah. kinds of questions that you can get to that will lead to what is the right way to market to yeah. you yeah. and how you have them help you? Can I pile on with one other example of, I mean, so that was a great example for the right channels, right? Where do we, we put our content? But if you, uh, the example I wanted to throw out there was related to the value proposition, right? So 
I'm sure a number of people in the audience sell software of some kind or market software of some kind. So um, a number of years ago, we were uh, working with or for a company in the procurement space, e-procurement. So controlling spend, getting the best price, those kinds of things. And the value proposition they were going to market with was essentially that, save time, control spend, got it. The hook that those chief procurement officers actually cared about was not so much those pieces, that's a, that's a given. It was what it allowed them to do, which was negotiate better contracts. That's where they had the most strategic impact for their organizations. So when we led with that as the marketing value proposition, you know, the conversion rates, the attendance on webinars, all that kind of stuff went up to the right as, as marketers like to see. It, right. was, it was perfect. Because you just asked. Just asked. So all of this ask, right, turns into then marketing campaigns and programs, which are fueled by content. So I'm going to just, I'm going to ask, I'm going to pin you to the wall a little bit here. I'm going to ask you to rate something. If I was just to say, you know, Ron, in terms of the importance of growth and success of the company, how would you rate content as a fuel for that growth and that success? One, it's not important at all, right? Ten, it's vital to the importance of the growth and success of the company. How would you rate content and why? Oh, yeah, it, it's a 10 for sure. Um, if you refer back to some of the earlier comments about how much of that buyer's journey is happening such that the buyer would prefer not to have to deal with a, a salesperson, they're doing all that, uh, they're living that journey through the content. Um, and it's important as marketers to align the content to the journey. Now, that's not to say that you can't define the journey, you can't control the journey. I believe as marketers, it's our role to lay out the stepping stones that they may choose to step on on the journey. So those are the thought leadership contents, the best practices, the how-to guides, all the way down to the, the solution demos and those kinds of things. If you start trying to map the, an individual buyer's journey, it's a ball of spaghetti. It does not follow a linear path. If you then take the concept of the buyer's group that we know exists in most enterprise B2B sales, that's multiple balls of spaghetti all tangled up in a mess. So trying to dictate how that's going to flow is just, a, it, it's a, it's, uh, I don't want to say fool's errand, but that's the, the, the word that comes to mind. It's not going to be a productive exercise, having witnessed it attempted before. Uh, but if we approach it from the perspective of we need the relevant topics to capture their interest at the top and those things to help nurture their, un <laughs> nurture. <laughs> nurture their understanding um, of the solution over time, you can lay out those stepping stones for them. Absolutely. And... Well, I, I've had to explain to me the buyer's journey is spaghetti, right, these days. And you don't have any idea, but right at the end of the process, somebody's going to be consuming a, a thought leadership piece of content, right, that helps them, you know, accelerate, or it's a, a one sheet that you've created. You don't know, but you do have to have those stepping stones, and you do have to have at least an idea of how you think they should be laid out. Even if the paths can go like this, <laughs> you know, yes. from, one, from one stone itself. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what it is that you think is the priority when you've, when you've had these conversations, um, you've done the just ask, right? You've gotten into the buyer's journey. You've laid out these stepping stones. How do you interface with sales? in terms of translating what you've learned is into content, you've expressed it in the buyer's journey. Tell me a little bit about then, is it along the way that you're sharing with sales? Is it a big reveal at the end, which I don't think it is, right? But how do you then translate all of this valuable content and marketing for use in the sales department? Oh, uh, I think you've had multiple people uh, on the podcast talking about the metrics and the passing qualified leads over to sales and, you know, that whole metric. This is just the front end of that. This just makes sure that we're bringing, attracting the right people with the right interests and the right motivations into the early stages of the process and then feeding them all the way through. So in our world right now, every time a, mark, um, a sales prospect 
touches any one of those marketing deliverables we've come up with after doing this exercise of just asking, making sure we're dialed into the needs, wants, and interests of the market, um, our sales team knows about it at each step of the way. Um, I don't know if that answers your question directly, but it is, we don't bore them with the front end. We're going to go talk to some people, but they see the benefits as every single campaign rolls out and every single time a customer interacts with a, a piece of content. And in doing it this way, it more of the content becomes evergreen than you might otherwise have expected. We've got some very well-performing uh, marketing campaigns that are you know, evergreen content still on the website, uh, still attracting people uh, to this day. Oh, that's great. Tell me a little bit about, you know, you talked about having a seat at the table, right? You know, and that representing the customer's voice at the seat of the table. What does that mean? Can you kind of explain that yeah. concept? So, uh, and this is where I think working in big companies, small companies, and uh, having clients in a number of different sized companies, I've seen different company personas go by, if you will, where there's a, a locus of control or, or um, clout, if I can use that word. So sometimes, I'm sure we've all experienced this, right? Sometimes there's the, uh, the braggadocious CEO uh, kind of leading the charge and we all will follow that. Um, sometimes it's a sales-led organization where you know, maybe there's a little more of a bias to the near-term opportunities and the strategic decisions are made based on closing that next, next big deal. Uh, in other places, it's product-led, right? The, the engineering department, the people building uh, the market tend to be the loudest voice. And unintentionally, marketing can kind of become the quieter voice, has less proof points, has less things that would drive decisions in the short term. Um, and I believe that having that voice of the, not just voice of the customer, but voice of the market, voice of the market, it's something I used to try to get to, to stick in conversations, but it, it didn't take. Um, but it's more than just voice of the customer. You need the voice of those people who aren't customers, are not customers yet. Um, and so when decisions are being made around the executive table and these discussions are, are happening, having these conversations, these just ask conversations can put marketing in the position of, mm, I hear what you're saying, um, but we've talked to these 20 clients or prospects and they've said something a little different. Maybe we should compare notes. Uh, it changes the dynamic quickly if you have those proof points to bring forward. Without having to say, hang on a second. I've got a trump card for what you just said. <laughs> Without having to have the heavy hand, everybody knows. Everyone knows that the customer is the highest voice of authority in the company, right? And so, and, and there, I'm going to sort of pile on for half a second. Um, there are blind spots. We all have them. Every company has them. And in the age of automation and Net Promoter Score, and you know, you, you finish that little chat support window in, in whatever app you're using, and how would you rate the performance? Having interviewed dozens of net promoter score respondents, uh, we know for a fact that most of them just click anything to get that thing off the screen, um, best case, uh, or you're only capturing the sentiment in a moment of time. Yeah. It completely ignores the rest of the, the customer journey. Um, then newsflash, the customer journey is rarely what you intend it to be. Yeah. On paper, it looks really good, right? Sales, handoff, implementation, training, support, customer success. And all of those things are supposed to play nicely together in a joyful, pleasant customer experience. But it rarely happens that way. Um, and so this is another way to uncover those blind spots and actually becomes a really important source of valuable insight for the company to make sure that what they intend the customer experience to be is reality. Yeah, it's... Uh... You know, you had mentioned, I think, before we click the record button here that, you know, marketing departments tend to, you know, have good familiarity with their customers, but not the depth of learning that you're talking about here and in the ways that you're talking about here. And one of the biggest roles, I think, in, in marketing, what a CMO can bring to the organization and it impacts sales, it impacts marketing, it impacts customer success, it impacts the growth of the business, is being that voice for the customer in the meetings, in the decision-making, in the planning sessions. If it's not there, then I don't know how we do it because we're, we are proxies for our, for our customers. We are not our customers, right? 
So if we think about it in that term, then how do we really represent them in everything that we're doing? But I just talked to uh, a gentleman, he was anointed CRO of the year oh. and, uh, and asked him about how, does it, how do you get to be CRO of the year, right? You know, seems like a pretty good question. And one of the things that he said is it starts at a cultural level in our company. They call their customers partners because they know that their partner's success is their success. So that's just the, like a cultural, you know, customer centric point of view that has to be backed up by a customer, like a, a dogged, like, you know, curiosity and you know, determination to make sure that we understand and we represent them and the market to your, to your point of view there. So you talk about this as a lost art. <laughs> Tell me what you mean by that. I just think as um, we have touched on this a little bit already, but if you think about the pressures that are on a given marketing department and, you know, listening to some of the other podcasts and some of the other CMOs, um, there's a persona there too, right? It's like, we're coming in, we got the metrics, we're driving pipeline and we're, we're charging ahead. Absolutely agree. None of this that we're talking about today dilutes that the importance of that in any way. Um, but that can be um, an all-consuming um, effort and process for a, for a marketing department. Um, this is a little softer and I don't, a lot of companies kind of lose the ability to do it. They don't have the bandwidth. Um, I spoke to a CEO in, in recent history and described the value of marketing, having these conversations and just asking. And he was perplexed. And was, well, why is marketing talking to customers? Not even kidding. Um, so it is a little different, right? It's, it's, it's changed with all customer success and support and all these measurement tactics. This simple, old-fashioned, let's just go talk to people and have a conversation. We have two ears and one mouth kind of thing. Um, it, it just kind of gotten lost, um, I, I think. And it feels like a contrarian and old school to be advocating for it. But the value derived from it repeatedly um, throughout my career has just been, I don't know, in, I don't say incalculable. It sounds a little dramatic, but um, I, I would challenge CMOs out there. Go do it personally or have someone on your team do it. I call it the 10 customer challenge. Go talk to 10 of them. Mm. Just let them talk. You're going to learn stuff. Guarantee it. And it won't be what you're expecting to learn. You'll find blind spots. You know, it's interesting. This literally two days ago in the LinkedIn feed, I was tagged in a post and it was a gentleman um, who had been mentioned on one of my podcasts by a CEO. And he was talking about the very importance of what you're talking about here. And he said he was an outside consultant and he worked with companies. And he said, it's amazing how many times I ask marketing, can you give me a list of customers that I can start to talk to? And his takeaway was that most marketing departments scrambled to come up with that list of customers, not because there wasn't a list of customers, but because they didn't have any familiarity with these customers. Exactly. And that's the, that's the dynamic you're saying we have to avoid, right? Yes. Yeah. And it should be a part of our job because we can, with that, with the functional responsibilities of being a CMO, we can, we can get up to here and what we have to do. But when you step, take a step back and you say, okay, but what are the most important things that I need to be doing? That's where my time should be allocated. And I think what you're saying is, there's no higher responsibility for you as a CMO to create sec success within your organization than be constantly talking with your customers. Absolutely. It is, in my opinion, the most important thing we can do. It feeds everything else marketing can, would, and should be doing. Yep. I think that that places the, the priority and the emphasis. So I think everybody should be thinking right now, like, and I don't want to diminish this to a percentage of time, but how much time would you recommend spending talking to customers? Like, is this something that's a, a daily, a weekly thing? Does it ever end, <laughs> right? Or is it a constant part of the, the role and responsibility of, of today's CMO? How, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. Um, and I'm, uh, 
well, feeling a little guilty about espousing this right now. Um, I'm personally feeling a little untethered from our customer base because I haven't had personal conversations with customers in a, a month. It feels unnatural to me to be kind of in this, this information void. There are other people on the team having conversations, so uh, we're covered. I, I've seen... I've seen companies do it and, and I've approached it different ways. Sometimes there's, we need to figure out something. So let's go talk to 20 as fast as we can. Um, but ideally, it's just something, it's normal operating procedure, right? If you've got a, a content team and they're coming up with the content strategy and we're going to put together this content and it's going to drive leads and do that kind of stuff, this should just be part of their operating procedure um, mm -hmm. that would determine what their content's going to be. What are we going to talk about, write about? Uh, is it going to be... Uh, a podcast? Is it going to be an ebook? Is it going to be a, a, a video? Wh whatever. All of that can come from those conversations. So that just keeps your marketing sharp. Um, and then from an executive level uh, perspective, I think it's good to have a, you know, a handful a month just to keep a pulse. And so if it's you having the conversations, somebody A, person A, person B on your team having these conversations, how does the the total of those conversations mm. become a known, not only in the marketing department, but throughout the company, right? Because yeah. these are, we just got through talking about how valuable these conversations are, right? Um, so how does that get then translated to a, call it internal, you know, learning program inside of the company? Yeah, uh, great question and not an insignificant challenge. Um, so what we've been using and has worked really well is um, a tool for qualitative research. So we can capture the notes from the interview and then we can tag every single response. So if somebody says something positive about the product or negative, we can tag it. And over time, those tags can then evolve. So they could say something positive about reporting. And so we start to build that out. And then that, all, that becomes a repository that other people can access. And it also puts us in a position to be able to summarize periodically and send it back out to the organization. So that is a very important piece. Um, sticking it all in a Google Doc is easy during the interview process, but that doesn't lend itself well to sharing later. Right, right. So important, right? Because we we don't want these things that we're learning just to be here. Right? right. They have they they have to be actionable in order to to actually make make an impact. And, and it is worth having the discipline and carving out the time and you know lived this and learned this the hard way. Um, the 20 minute or half hour conversation you have is not just half hour or 20 minute, you know, time management wise budget an hour sometime in the prior three weeks to get it set up and then to properly process, get the notes done and ingest and make sense of the, the conversation. Give yourself another half hour to an hour. Right. Good. But well worth it. And I, I love that the feeling you just talked about of, I feel a little bit untethered, right? Because it's been like a month since I was doing this. I know there's us on the phone that are saying, Ooh, it's been, it's been a little bit longer than a month <laughs> since I've done this. So what I want to do, we, we've covered so much territory here. Um, but if there was a, a single takeaway that you had for the audience, there's one thing that we need to really remember from our conversation here, what would that be? Uh, just one. <laughs> um, you're, so you're the guest, I'd be back so to you. You're the boss. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'd reiterate: content is a ten. The processes we've sp spoken about here today make sure your customers will perceive it as a ten as well. It will be good, relevant, timely, in all the right channels. Um, and the two have blind spots. And so in addition to using this to get the content right, also use it to make sure that that customer experience, that customer journey you intend is the one, or at least close to the one they're getting, right? Nobody intends for support tickets to take too long to have escalated and resolved. Nobody intends for the first experience they have with customer success to be a, you're going to renew, right? Um, everybody has higher order aspirations for those services but it doesn't always pan out the way we think. So this is just, for example, another way of understanding what's really going on. I love that. I love that. Ron, if there was, there was follow-up questions or conversations that people wanted to have with you as a result of seeing you here, um, would it be good to maybe provide a link to your LinkedIn profile for people to get a hold of you? 
yeah, that'd be great. I'm I'm on LinkedIn. Um, do I give it, read it? <laughs> yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with anybody and everybody out there. Fantastic. Well, thank you for coming on and thank you for sharing all the insights. You've given us a lot to think about and a lot to just ask. I love Get that it. closing. Thank you for having me. It's been great. <laughs> Thanks. We'll talk to you soon.